Hello, uh, my name is uh, Jean-Marc Rickley and I'm the head of Global and Emerging Risk at the Geneva Center for uh, Security Policy. Uh, the GCSP is an international nonprofit foundation physically based in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, com comprised of a foundation council that has 53 states as well as the canton of Geneva. Among uh, the states that are part of the governing board, uh, we have all the five permanent uh, member of the UN Security Council. The GCSP mission is to promote peace and international security, to prepare and transform individuals and organizations so they can create a safer world and the values that we are relying upon our impartiality, independence and inclusivity. The center conducts uh, its mission through different tracks, through executive education, through research, through public discussion uh, with a di different type of audience, and in addition with an innovative fellowship program uh, for executives in, in transition. Our goal is to help current and future leaders to be better decision makers and to nurture a global community of leaders who advance peace and security globally. Our community has grown substantially over the last five years. It reaches now more than 8,500 uh, alumni around the world in 165 countries. So the purpose of this discussion today is to inaugurate our new uh, Polymath uh, initiative, uh, which is a, a new initiative that is based in the Global Fellowship uh, Initiative of GCSP. The Polymath Initiative is has been generously uh, supported by uh, the Didier and Martin Polymath Foundation. And uh, the goal of this Polymath Initiative is to bridge the gap between policymakers and the scientific and technology community. It came out of the realization that um, Increasingly, people are working in silos, but when we see developments in emerging technologies, uh, we cannot uh, spare uh, the fact of not thinking transversally. So we need people who are really good to, and for understanding technology, but at the same time, people who understand policymaking as well as the broader impact that this technology have on society. And the um, Didier and my in Prima Foundation uh, was in line with that kind of development to raise awareness about uh, the impact of these technologies on a society and therefore funded free fellowship position in artificial intelligence, which is currently held by uh, Dr. Sandra Scott Herod. Uh, she is senior lecturer at the School of Electronics, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Queen's uh, University in Belfast. In neurotechnology, uh, our neuro, uh, um, polymath fellow in neurotechnology is um, Dr. Ricardo Chavarriaga, head of CLEAR initiative in uh, Zurich, Switzerland. And in synthetic biology, our uh, polymath fellow in synthetic biology is uh, Dr. Kevin Esfel. He's assistant professor at MIT lab in uh, Boston. So the topic of today is really to paint a picture about the good uh, things that can be achieved uh, with these free uh, technologies, but also to look at uh, the potential malicious uses of uh, this technology. The purpose is not to say that technology is bad, but to raise awareness about the potential that this uh, technology could have in terms of uh, impact on society and the disruption that they could create. Uh, the webinar will be run as follow. We'll have a free presentation first by our uh, free fellows, about 12, 13 minutes each, and then we will have a uh, uh, we'll open for a question and answer. So if you have any question, please use uh, the Q&A uh, tab to uh, ask your question and then we will select, uh, we'll try to select as many as possible. So without uh, further ado, uh, I let Sandra uh, kickstart uh, this meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just share my screen. Got a few slides for this. Um, so. Thank you very much to GCSP uh, and particularly to Jean-Marc and Federico for organizing today's uh, session. Um, it's my pleasure to talk to you um, on the topic of the good, the bad and the ugly uh, of AI. 
So just a brief introduction. Uh, Jean-Marc mentioned that I'm a senior lecturer at Queen's University Belfast. Um, got their beautiful Lanyon building here on the left-hand side and our slightly more modern uh, Center for Secure Information Technologies, our research institute in cybersecurity uh, based in, in uh, ESIT Institute. So we're based in Belfast uh, in the north of Ireland. So I'm not going to attempt to define AI. Uh, I don't think there's any a single agreed definition of, of artificial intelligence. Um, but I, what I wanted to do was just frame uh, the, the, what I describe as AI uh, in this brief talk. Uh, and the framing that I'm using is a general AI versus narrow AI, which has been uh, presented in a recent uh, publication by Alexandra Patel, um, the Artificial Intelligence and UK National Security um, document in 2020. So general AI is this idea of machine intelligence with agency, reasoning, and adaptability of a human brain. It's generally considered to be futuristic. Okay, we're, we're not there yet. Uh, what we have today uh, and what I'm talking about predominantly today is narrow AI, which is tending towards this, this movement uh, in terms of the work to tend towards the general capability. But what we really have is this machine intelligence that's trained very well on very narrowly defined uh, tasks. So we've got the example of playing chess, IBM Watson, maybe beating a, a player, a, a human player at chess driving a car, uh, the concept of, of self-driving uh, autonomous vehicles, or translation of documents, for example. So that's the, the context that we're talking about, this narrow uh, problem-solving approach. Now, in terms of good or, or potentially good implementations, and for any of these examples that I give, you could take the flip side and say, but, 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 uh, we'll come to that uh, in terms of the challenges that we have in the implementations today. But Sustainability is an example here of how we can leverage the benefit of AI models for optimization uh, of our energy usage, for example, in a smart city, in smart factories, consideration of traffic management uh, within, a, within a smart city again, or automated driving to reduce our consumption and reduce our impact on the planet, to take the best we can out of the resources we have available to us. Uh, so that's some of the good use of, of, of an AI modeling uh, across a whole host of different systems within a smart city environment. Similarly, there are a multitude of examples in the health sphere. Uh, this example here, apologies for the, the poor resolution of that figure. Basically, what it's showing is an application of a series of different uh, machine learning and deep learning techniques applied at different phases uh, of, in this case, a biomarker discovery process. So biomarker being a characteristic that we can measure to give an indication of, of disease, a sign of disease, for example. So we can use it for diagnosis, for prediction, for monitoring, uh, and hopefully for, for uh, development of preventative measures, for example. So there's a lot of uh, work that's being done uh, today using AMI models to actually uh, deploy biomarker discovery. A more uh, accessible example, perhaps, uh, is the idea of robot-assisted surgery, uh, also leaning towards AI-assisted surgery, um, where we move towards that more predictive uh, and dynamic implementation, the robot-assisted being much more defined around the narrow AI scope, uh, general AI tending towards uh, the, the potential to do more and, and for, for the, the, the machine itself to predict how it might uh, implement a particular technique, for example. So there we're talking about leveraging the benefits of AI for precision efficiency uh, in these kind of health implementations. In the, my own uh, sphere, so in the in cybersecurity, AI models are used extensively. So for example, classification, looking at identifying attacks from normal uh, traffic in the network, for example, denial of service attacks, where you're targeting a system to take it down, put it out of, out of use. Also for the detection of fraud, detection of spam, detection of malware, malicious software uh, deployed on networks again, uh, to lead to other different attacks uh, that link into the, the physical uh, physical security world. For example, the example there being ransomware, um, uh, uh, encrypting uh, malicious, using malicious malware, malicious software to encrypt files and then demanding ransom uh, to release those. And that's been heavily uh, seen across uh, across the uh, the globe over the last year or so. So a whole suite of different beneficial implementations where we can take these AI models 
uh, and then use them for services to facilitate things that we do or uh, in, in each of those spaces. But it doesn't come without issue. So one of the, the reasons that machine learning has been tended towards for any of those addressing any of those problems is because of the massive data sets that we encounter looking at any of those systems. So smart cities, you've got a whole suite of sensors uh, picking up information from different points. You want to be able to interpret that uh, and make sensible decisions and optimizations of your systems based on that. But what, what is in that data is a, is a clear uh, issue. So we've come across issues of bias in data sets. Um, so for example, the data set not representing a population. Uh, for example, if you think about the, the health space, if we do a clinical trial and clinical trials are predominantly uh, uh, have white male uh, patients involved in them, if we then develop a model based on that information, that data set that we've used from a clinical trial, for example, expect to predict um, the similar type of uh, disease or, or discovery on a black female patient, do we get uh, the, uh, the right or expected result or are we not uh, capturing the right uh, uh, volume or the right uh, characteristics within our data sets? So we know there are ex uh, dozens and, and hundreds, I would say, actually of examples of, of the issue of bias uh, within the data or the, the lack of um, complete data sets, for example. On here, I've got a couple examples of the, the privacy issue. So Clearview AI being a facial recognition platform, uh, a very uh, large company offering this, this, this platform. And, and over the very recently over this month, uh, both in Australia uh, and in the UK itself, they've been uh, fined or looking to, to, to find AI, Clearview AI at least, for breach of data protection laws applied in those particular jurisdictions. The issue there being that when we capture information, and the reason I didn't mention facial recognition as a benefit within um, or as a good practice or, or implementation of AI in the smart city was because of this issue of the data itself, who has given permission for that data to be used. Uh, Facebook itself has shut down um, their facial recognition system, or meta, as they are now called, um, shut down their facial recognition system and planning to delete these face prints that are being captured from data without user consent, essentially, uh, which, which challenges us from a, on a data privacy perspective, from an ownership perspective. Uh, we want to feed these systems with large volumes of information so that we get good, uh, good representative results, but we need data um, and oftentimes the, the examples that we've seen and when it's you know, covered in the media, the issue is that the data sets have not necessarily been appropriately uh, captured or, or prepared. Um, another issue associated to, to the use of the AI models is, is explainability. So whether we can actually describe and define um, well why a particular model came to a decision that it came to. And that's some of the directions that we need to look at in terms of the, the challenges that we associate today. So the issue, as opposed to, to summarize in terms of the, the challenge that we face with AI as an, as an emerging technology, although we're all very familiar with the term, we're seeing it massively deployed, We've got governments and uh, companies developing systems using AI models, using data sets, but without the considerations, the relevant considerations uh, that need to be made with respect uh, to security and privacy associated to deployment of those services. So linking in then on the security perspective, we also have the challenge of we're developing these, let's call us uh, the good guys, uh, but there are, are bad actors out there too. Uh, when we put these tools or the capabilities and a lot of these uh, platforms and models are openly available, naturally in the research world, uh, we tried to try and open source uh, our data sets, open source uh, our models, et cetera, and solutions. Uh, they're also available to the attacker. Uh, what you see on the screen here is just an illustration of across within our um, it, the cybersecurity world, we have a, an attack uh, phase or series of, of phases within the attack cycle. Uh, and at each of those, you could potentially 
as a malicious actor, leverage AI to accelerate your processes. So you can accelerate the process of reconnaissance, trying to explore what the, if it, you're looking at a network attack, for example, what's on the network, what, salute, what uh, uh, targets might be available for you to, to explore or exploit. And then in the delivery, again, to, to send out uh, your, your malicious payload, for example, you can use a, a AI acceleration uh, processes or automated processes in there to try and develop uh, uh, methods to, to cycle across multiple attack uh, directives. So the unfortunately, these solutions are being uh, misused as well uh, and used to for the same things, for the precision, for the efficiency uh, that we look for in the good models, we can see those used in, in bad models. A fine example that probably will be very familiar to, to many of you, um, as there's a plenty of media coverage around these, both deep fakes and misinformation. So this is an example uh, just from this, this, this paper here showing the ability to use an AI model to produce a deep fake image um, where you have the original uh, authentic image uh, replaced, the, 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 the face on that image being replaced uh, with the face of another actor. Um, and there are open source tools available to produce these uh, deep fake images. So from a security perspective, our issue here is really the, the, um, the implication on trust, uh, on our, our individual understanding uh, or appreciation of what we can and cannot trust uh, within the media, within the world around us. Is this uh, an authentic image? Is it a fake image? What consequence does that have in terms of uh, my uh, what, what I might uh, do or respond when I see this particular image? And similarly, it's applied across text-based information as well in terms of misinformation uh, being put out into the, the public domain. So very good uh, potential uses of, of AI and existing use of AI. A lot of challenges uh, not necessarily being uh, addressed adequately. Some of them being addressed within the research space, uh, but still to be pushed out um, more broadly, uh, and also to try and raise awareness uh, amongst uh, companies and organizations using AI models, lifting these off the shelf solutions and deploying those themselves as to what's involved. So just to conclude, I wanted to highlight the something that I think we is, is useful to do here, I guess the, the initiative, the polymath initiative of GCSP is particularly beneficial to try and bring together people talking about the technical issues, the policy issues, the regulatory issues, the legal issues of these different uh, technologies and to discuss those. At Queen's, we have a doctoral program where our objective is to train doctoral scholars on interdisciplinary problems. So we look at different practices, different solutions, some of them leading from a technical perspective and how, what kind of policy implications there might be for a particular technical solution that's based on an algorithmic solution being presented uh, to the community. And conversely, for those looking at more policy or regulatory focus, what technical consequences or, or, or aspects should be considered uh, within that particular uh, research or development. So to develop a, a cohort of scholars who are proficient in these, um, in these aspects, taking account of both, um, of, or, well, all, I suppose, it's a multidisciplinary uh, approach that we're looking for. Um, so that's one of the ways I think that we're seeing uh, this, uh, the challenge of any of these emerging technologies being addressed by trying to bring together people to, to review those issues. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there um, and I'm happy to take questions. I think we'll, we're, they're probably being kept until the, till the end of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra, for uh, providing lots of uh, food for thoughts and also for your conclusion that uh, it's through transdisciplinary thinking that we'll be able to overcome uh, this issue. This is very much, much the core of uh, why this initiative uh, was uh, set up. Our next speaker is uh, Ricardo Chavarriga. Ricardo? Yes, sir. Thank you. So I will. First, I'd uh, like to thank uh, Jean-Marc, uh, the GCSP and the Primat Foundation for the opportunity of uh, yeah, working this uh, polymath uh, initiative. And I'm gonna talk about neuro technologies and brain machine interfaces. And when we talk about neuro technologies, we are talking about technologies that allow us to measure the activity of the brain, interpret that activity and use it to interact with the world uh, 
by controlling uh, prosthetic devices, assistive devices, by interacting with uh, games or other applications. And also technologies that allows us to stimulate the brain or the nervous system to send information from the environment to the person using the neural activity. And uh, why are we developing these kind of technologies? Let's start with some numbers. Uh, the cost of mental health in Europe is about 600 billion uh, of euros a year. So it's a huge cost to society, issues of mental health. And uh, the pharmaceutical uh, industry has had a very difficult time in finding pharmacological solutions to some of these, um, these uh, diseases or disorders that affect our brain. One of the reasons for that is that we have a poor understanding of the brain. So having technologies that allows us to interface directly with uh, <clears throat> our nervous system can improve the knowledge that we have, can lead to better um, treatments, better interventions to address this, um, these diseases, these disorders. And by doing so, it can improve the quality of life of the population around the world. <clears throat> It's worth noticing that uh, the impact of mental health is being increasing over years as the um, age uh, expectancy or life expect expectancy of our society is increasing as well. And most of this cost is absorbed by public institutions. So there is a huge interest of developing technological solutions that can address this cost. So these neurotechnologies have already started to show the, the effect in some, some aspects. Here we can see one example of what is called deep brain stimulation. These are electrodes that are implanted into the brain and are sending electrical stimulation into certain specific targeted areas. And uh, it has proven to uh, be quite effective on, in reducing the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And currently, this is an accepted and validated clinical approach. And there are hundreds of thousands of people that are using this as of today. Um, it's currently as well being studied for all other types of cognitive disorders, such as obsessive compulsive disorder, addiction, and others. Other very uh, illustrative example of new technologies is cochlear implants that are uh, again, systems that have been validated and already commercialized, where these electrodes are implanted in the cochlea, in the inner ear, and sent and transform the sounds of the environment into electrical stimulation that go to the auditory nerve and from there to the brain of people and can help uh, restore audition in uh, people from two years all the way to 80 years. And uh, here we can see another example of a prosthetic device that has, uh, has been endowed with electrodes that can send electrical information that is interpreted by the subject as tactile information that can restore not only the mobility of, um, of the arm through the prosthetic uh, device, but also send back information such as the temperature, the pressure, the force, and uh, allowing to restore uh, the, these capabilities as well. So there's a huge interest on on developing these uh, <clears throat> these technologies it can bring a uh, huge uh, impact on the medical on the medical sector, but also in other types of application and have have generated interest in gaming companies in uh, in developing systems for, for instance, monitoring uh, the health and well being of um, of people and workers as well as in the military domain. So. This is what we can consider uh, the good side uh, or of these technologies, the possibility of better understanding one of the most complex systems in the universe, which is the brain, helping through that to have better solutions to mental disorders, cognitive disorders, and also better interaction with the, with the systems that we have in our society and overall improving the quality of life. But of course, not, not everything is so rosy. There are some bad or not so good aspects of this uh, development. First of all, uh, you have to mention that there still exist some barriers in the technology transfer process from the research area on this type of technologies to systems that can uh, act and have a real impact in the world. Um, some of these barriers come from the difficulty and cost of um, 
developing these systems, in particular when they are targeting a, a limited part of the population. This is the case of some uh, very uh, in very strong uh, motor disorders or severe paralysis that where these technologies can have a huge impact, but the market size is not, uh, is not so big. Therefore, there is not enough incentives for developing them. Uh, on the other hand, there, is, there are other areas when there is a, a larger, mar larger market, which is the direct to consumer technology, the possibility of developing this system, not only for uh, medical applications, but also for gaming, for uh, well being. And that has brought this new wave of technology that is direct to consumer. But this can have a benefit in the sense that it can reduce the cost, can all possibly open the way for have cheaper systems that can then become as well useful for medical applications. So this is a possibility where there is a synergy between developing direct to consumer technology and then have the improvements that lead to cheaper and more e efficient uh, medical technology as well. However, the direct to consumer sector is not <clears throat> very well regulated. There is not uh, very uh, not enough information about how the systems can be validated uh, because sometimes the, this this uh, development are not done in the research sector but in the private sector, and they are often developed in uh, with a very small population, and that leads to issues such as bias. Uh, one aspect that was mentioned before uh, when talking about AI. And another aspect that we have is that uh, with the democratization of these technologies, when we go to direct to consumer, then we can have communities such as the do-it-yourself uh, community, hacking community that can develop new technologies for, for instance, stimulating the brain using very simple off-the-shelf mechanisms. And we can, with something about $10, create a system that can be used as a stimulator of the brain. Uh, without necessarily having all the, all the safety mechanisms to ensure that there will be not uh, malicious effects on the brain of the person that is using it. So there is a, a, a potential risk that can be appear here uh, at the individual level. But another aspect where there can be risks on this type of technologies is that they will allow the potential collection of data, brain data, at a large scale. And then all of the issues that we start to see with uh, artificial intelligence and database technologies like social media will as well affect these neurotechnologies with the possibility of having access to information directly from the brain, possibly information that people are not willing to reveal, but that is captured and can be inferred up to a certain extent by these systems as well. So there is a great potential of a threat to privacy, to mental privacy that will come up on top of the existing threats that we have today used with the data that is collected by other means. <laughs> and once we have this possibility and we can measure the mental activity, infer some information about that, we can use it for, for instance, do some digital mental phenotyping. We can identify traits of a person of a population that can be used to, uh, for instance, score their, capa their capabilities, to identify whether it's worth uh, for doing a particular job or for accessing a particular service. And uh, this can be potentially dangerous. And it can be dangerous if it works, because we can have a tool that allows us to target individuals or population but can also be dangerous if it doesn't work. Because as we saw with um, facial recognition, some companies, some public bodies, and some governments adopted these technologies even before having a proper validation of that. So we can leave again some of the mistakes that, were, that have happened with other technologies, only that in this case, we are also adding information about the mental activity, about mental states and cognitive states of these individuals. So this can be a, a particular risk of what's, uh, that these things can bring. And once we have this possibility, we enter into an uglier 
scenarios where we can target particular individuals. We can then decide who has access to it. And if we, if we do that, we will have a technology that can increase the inequalities that we have at the individual and at the social level based on the mental activity for which we, we have to say we don't have very good models so far because most of the studies that we have been doing in this um, in, in neuroscience are focused on smaller populations and that are not representative of the entire world. So as we go to a more generalized use of these technologies, we can try to say transfer models that haven't been validated on the entire diversity of, of the mental activity that we have. It's a diversity that we have within different populations. Uh, we have uh, people with, uh, for instance, certain uh, mental disorders and mental characteristics or certain syndromes that are not well characterized and can be categorized as, for instance, not worthy of accessing certain services or not worthy of having certain advantages in the world. So we can have here a clear potential of segregation through the mental activity. Also, uh, we can have in say passive coercion for people to use these technologies in order to have this um, access to these services. If, we, if, we, if we, someone says, you need to go through this test in order to be hired in this place, or we need to monitor your cognitive states, your level of stress, your level of attention, if you want to do this particularly stressful job, there is a risk that these signals can be used for other purposes. And therefore, having a, a, a risk that can be, as, I, as I've said before, in, at the individual or at the social level. There can be as well a difference between the have and the have nots, who has access to these technologies, who has access as individual, who has access as a country and who's developing them. That uh, can therefore uh, bring the, these technologies that are initially intended to improve the quality of life, then creating the possibility of a brave new world where some people are deemed worth of the benefits that modern society has and the, our, um, see, all, all our progress has, and others are simply not deemed worthy of them. And to finish, I would like to, to mention that when we use neurotechnologies and when we develop neurotechnologies, are we, what we are actually doing is relying in other emerging technologies. So we are using artificial intelligence to process the data, to infer information about the, the person from the activity of the brain signals. Therefore, we are inheriting the good, the bad, and the ugly of artificial intelligence. Some of these uh, neuro, neuro technologies, some of these interfaces are now trying to use new ways to measure the brain activity or to interact with the brain. And one of them is through the use of manufactured bio viruses that can help to have a targeted activation of the neurons. And this is what we call optogenetics. We can have a, a, a virus that responds to light and generates a activity at particular parts of the brain. So we can also inherit the good, the bad, and the ugly of synthetic biology. So what we are talking here is a problem of emerging technologies that we need to, that we are still developing them. We have plenty of unknowns on how do these technologies work? How do they interact with the users and how the users will use uh, actually these technologies, what would be either in the way that it was they were intended or it will all be open to malicious or uh, misuse malicious use or misuse of these technologies. So we will need to be very careful on developing them and to continuously monitor where the risks appear. I have mentioned some of the risks that are currently known. It is not clear when they will materialize if they materialize uh, in the first place, but there are still many other possibilities of risks that appear once the technology evolves once new uses are proposed and new actors start to interact with that. 
and uh, I will, with this I'm gonna I'm gonna close my part on saying that the use of neurotechnologies, as I said, involves many communities and it's very important to interact across them. I am involved in several of these initiatives, like the Polymath Initiative with GCSP, with IEEE, which is a technical association that not only develops technology, but also works on standards uh, with the IEEE Brain Initiative and the International Brain Initiative, where we try to link the uh, global brain initiatives uh, in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, in Japan, in Korea, so that we try to have a global approach, try to reduce the bias that we have when we study the brain and be able to build knowledge that actually reflects the diversity that we have all across the world. And last but not least, I, work, I also work with the Claire Network that is trying to promote trustworthy artificial intelligence here in Europe. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo, for highlighting um, also a very comprehensive landscape about potential um, misuses and things can, can go wrong, as well as uh, highlighting how these different technology converge. And it's maybe a point that we will uh, uh, talk about in the Q&A. Uh, for all our viewers, uh, again, um, if you have any question, uh, please, um, write them in the Q&A and then we'll have uh, time to address them uh, after uh, Kevin's uh, presentation. Kevin, the screen is yours. All right, thank you, Jean-Marc. So Ricardo mentioned synthetic biology and the security vulnerabilities thereof, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and how these spill out into areas such as neurotech. They can also spill out into other areas and that is definitely gonna be a problem, but we should also recognize the good first. So here is a depiction of the SARS-CoV-2 genome. So SARS-2 has a lot of different genes, roughly 30,000 base pairs of RNA. One of the most inspiring things to see in the depths of the tragedy that was the pandemic was the entire scientific community coming together to help come up with novel treatments and ways of addressing this problem. And a lot of them were able to do it because of synthetic biology, giving them access to the virus and allowing them to tinker with it, or at least to pieces of the virus. This here is a protocol that actually gives virologists the ability to make the entire virus in the laboratory in order to test new therapeutics and vaccines. And this kind of technology, the ability to just make a piece of the virus immediately was absolutely instrumental in the development of the mRNA vaccines, but not just the mRNA vaccines, also all of the adenoviral vaccines, including AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson and the others, they all use this particular technology for writing DNA. Now our ability to read and write in the language of life has been utterly transformative for our ability to understand how living systems work and engineer them so that they work more effectively for the benefit of humanity and the natural world. So we're starting to see an increasing number of applications of biotech coming to the clinic. An ever greater fraction of drugs are actually biologics rather than small molecule chemistry. And we're starting to see an increasing number of projects that use engineered biology to sustainably address a societal need in an environmentally friendly way. And this is rippling through the supply chain and so forth. We can now design vaccines in a day, right? I mean, this is amazing. Moderna's vaccine was literally designed in less than 48 hours and BioNTech says that theirs was in, was in less than 24, although they didn't decide on which particular version to use until later. With the mRNA vaccines, we'll be able to scale up manufacturing much more quickly because a factory for making these vaccines is just making RNA of some sequence. All the factories are the same. You just change the computers as to which particular RNA you want them to make. And we can similarly design and scale different diagnostic tests for detecting diseases. So we're gonna be better prepared for the next pandemic. What's more, we've proven that we can keep out dangerous viruses entirely, at least in some nations that are on the ball, either because they have geographic advantages or because they're willing to employ somewhat stricter measures for virus control. Although it's also worth noting that these have started to break down 
um, as the variants arise that are substantially more infectious. When it comes to regulating these technologies, with respect to those based on CRISPR, there's really a movement towards outside scrutiny, actually having folks who aren't actually developing the technology take a look at it early on, sometimes even communities who might be impacted by the eventual application are being invited to look at what's happening before the research is done. Kevin, yep. sorry, sorry to interrupt you. For, for our viewers who are not familiar with CRISPR, can you just explain in oh, yeah. a, few, a few what CRISPR, CRISPR is? Thank you. Apologies. Yeah, curse of knowledge. So CRISPR is a, is a revolutionary new genome editing technology that allows us to find any sequence we want in an entire genome and either cut it or change one base or recruit a protein to it or almost anything else that we like. But it's most commonly used for genome editing, changing the sequence of DNA. It's fair to say, though, that CRISPR is one of the four pillars of biotech, which is probably reading, writing, amplifying, and editing DNA. And what's more, major philanthropic funders, mostly from the tech sector, are now absolutely committed to mitigating catastrophic bio risks coming from future pandemics and the like. So this is all the good. We have this well-funded movement to actually take threats seriously. The bad is that we are still vulnerable. We can't actually make vaccines for all pathogens. We still don't have one for HIV, but we're kind of acting like we can. We're assuming that the next war is gonna be like the last war and we'll, are, we'll have a vaccine designed within 24 hours that will actually work. We shouldn't assume that. This time we failed to run challenge trials to get those vaccines into people's arms as quickly as possible even though there are enough volunteers to do so. Hundreds of thousands of people died needlessly waiting for regulatory meetings, which could have been held immediately as soon as the data was available, but they weren't. And I'm singling out the US FDA here because they were an egregious offender, but it's not like anywhere else in the world was that much faster at rolling out these vaccines, even though we had the safety data much earlier to show that they were worth the protection against the virus. That meant we failed to rapidly scale, and we certainly failed to fairly distribute vaccines worldwide. Far, far too many people now don't trust basic societal institutions and won't take vaccines. Those are now linked in the public mind. And we really, despite this epic global disaster, no nation has really committed any significant chunk of funds to prepare this. That's pretty sobering. Worse is to return to this heartening bit that I highlighted at the beginning. Yes, these technologies have allowed scientists the world over to lend their skills to helping fight the pandemic and, and all the other diseases that afflict us. But if you can make a virus, then you can make a virus. And we can do that now for lots of different virus families. This quote is fairly instructive. It is now a relatively straightforward matter to generate and test new virus configurations using what now amounts to the world's best Lego set. This was said by someone who clearly thinks about the positives and not too much about the negatives. Now, zero is the number of nations that screen synthetic DNA orders to make sure that people are not ordering those constructs on the left that allow you to make SARS-2 which of course could also be used to make SARS-1 or 1918 influenza virus or MERS or anything like that. No nations require DNA synthesis screening, although industry is working on it. Two million is the number of PhDs in the life sciences that have been granted in OECD countries in the last 30 years. Even if we assume that only 5% of those actually have the relevant skills in biotech, and particularly in mammalian tissue culture to actually follow the protocol to boot up a virus from synthetic DNA. And only 5% of those actually are, have done it recently enough that they'd be able to do it on their own. That's still 5,000 people with PhDs who could build any virus they want. Nothing stopping them. And fortunately, zero is the number of viruses that we know would cause another pandemic. So this is what is saving us. Tons of people can make viruses, but we don't know which ones would cause another pandemic. The problem 
is that many folks in public health would love to know exactly which natural viruses could cause pandemics because they think that would allow us to prepare for them. There are projects that are actively have it as their mission statement to collect and sequence 99% of the viruses out there and prioritize the high risk ones for further laboratory characterization. That is, they want to know, can they infect human cells efficiently? Can they replicate in human cells efficiently? And can they be transmitted efficiently between human animal models of disease? There are well-funded programs helping scientists do exactly this. And they actually create a watch list of viruses that are considered to be the greatest threats of causing the next pandemic. This is not just a US-funded initiative. Many nations are doing this kind of research. So if it succeeds, then the last piece will be in place. Whereas now we're at risk of spillovers and accidents. That is pandemics that have a virus released at a single site infecting initially one person who then spreads it to other people and to more people and to more people. This at least gives us a chance of controlling it because there's a single point of release and a single virus. But if we create a list of pandemic capable viruses through these pandemic virus prediction programs, then a malevolent actor could deliberately release several of them at travel hubs throughout the world. So even though it would be the same viruses as we might face eventually, they could all be released at once and in multiple travel hubs, which is not something that nature is ever gonna do. It's not something that's gonna happen from a lab accident either. So misuse would be much worse than the kinds of pandemics we're used to. That means that if we think these viruses are actually credible, they really could cause pandemics. And again, that's the point of the research. They wanna know which ones we need to worry about. But as soon as we share the list, then any extremist group will be able to credibly threaten the international community with releasing these viruses because we know that they're accessible. And we know from history that there are many individuals who would actually have released these things on the world. So that's pretty ugly. But my upshot is, look, this has been going on for over a decade. Folks have been actively trying to identify credible pandemic viruses, which are weapons of mass destruction that thanks to advances in biotech are now accessible to thousands. And really very few people highlighted this as a problem. So I think this is a general principle. We just need better security oversight of these, of these new technologies because my colleagues are brilliant, well-meaning scientists. They just don't think about security issues. But I wanna leave on that dark note because there, there is still hope. I think it's important that we add hope at the end. I mentioned that no nations require DNA synthesis screening, but, but I'm part of one project. And again, I'm biased in reporting things that I know, but we now have the technical ability to fully automate and universally screen DNA without having to disclose what the customer ordered, which is critical, of course, to protecting trade secrets. Companies don't wanna know what the others to know what they're researching. We can still screen their DNA synthesis orders without disclosing it. And this can be done using cryptography. We also, thanks to our ability to read DNA more and more and more effectively, we can sequence all the nucleic acids in the environment and detect any biological threat, even if it's something we've never seen before, even if it's something adversarially engineered to be unlike anything we've ever seen before and evade all of our other current detection systems, you can't hide the fact that a nucleic acid is becoming more common in the environment from sufficient DNA sequencing. And this is a system that we could roll out in travel hubs throughout the world in order to give us early warning of any next pandemic, be it natural, be it accidental, or be it deliberate. Now, there's even some precedent for international measures and policy that could encourage countries to actually begin doing things like screening DNA synthesis. If you look at the Biological Weapons Convention, we're very fortunate to have it because it sets all the right norms in place. Namely, thou shalt not develop, stockpile, assist, acquire, or retain biological weapons. And 
Article 4 says that nations are required to take any national measures necessary to prohibit and prevent the production of biological weapons within a state's territory. Arguably, if we can screen DNA synthesis to ensure that people can't just order DNA that lets them make pandemic viruses or other hazards, that's something that is required under the Biological Weapons Convention of signatories. Maybe we can use that to encourage that number to go from zero countries to maybe even close to all of them. So I'd like to thank first GCSP for the kind invitation, all of my colleagues on Secure DNA, which is a international science diplomacy project, no government involvement, but scientists from China, the US and Europe. And finally, uh, my group and our, and our funders and everyone at MIT who lets us continue this work. Happy to take questions, thanks. Thank you, Kevin. So, um, yeah, you really painted also a very interesting landscape with, uh, with full of challenges and uh, we don't have much time left, but I would like to kickstart the, the, the Q&A uh, with uh, two questions to, to all of you. And then we will uh, move to uh, Federico, he's a, the Padraic officer of the, the Polymath Initiative, who will um, address the question that were raised in, um, in, in the, in the Q&A tab. So for, for, for all of you, um, there are lots of issues to, to discuss. Um, one being, the issue of data and uh, knowledge. Um, um, Sandra demonstrated uh, the, 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 the risk of biases as well as uh, Ricardo. And so the question here is about what should we do in the future? I mean, to prevent the misuses of this data. This is the, 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 the first part. And the second is, at one point, information becomes a key strategic issue in, in itself. So um, should we care more about information security in the sense that we have to be careful about what kind of information scientists like you are uh, publicly uh, displaying. And the second is about the landscape of regulation in your field. Uh, who are the main uh, actors and um, what should be done better? You can pick up any of these uh, of these uh, questions. So Sandra, you want to, to, to start first? Sure. Um, okay, I'll pick up the first one then about, about the data. Uh, so uh, the I guess there's a couple of aspects to it. The first one is generating representative data. So there's, there's, there's activity still required there for any of our uh, implementations or systems to actually understand what, what categorize or what can be categorized as representative data. So covering the right data sets. The, in terms of the securing that, it's, it's hugely important and it's a key aspect within uh, any of the AI uh, based security implementations we look at the what there are different, I suppose, technologies being used there to almost remove the requirements so you can anonymize data pseudonym pseudonymize data to remove particular characteristics that might be um, useful, let's say, or, or too close to revealing privacy information, for example, about individuals. Um, but we know that they're not necessarily as um, secure as they could be. You know, that you can, putting enough, and the example I gave at the smart city is a key one where if we take data fusion in that scenario, we can actually piece together a lot from people uh, about from different data sources that we didn't think that we would necessarily be able to do. Um, so the technology is being put in there. What we can do from that perspective is to consider things like federated learning. Um, and that probably applies to some of the examples in synthetic biology and neurotechnology as well, where we piece together, we develop the implementations of our models that don't require all of the data at once. They use subsets of it at different times. Um, and then also the use of privacy preserving uh, techniques, for example, in terms of just deciding what part of the data um, we can use, like to, to using metadata, for example, or, or uh, reducing the, the reliance of models on particular data um, elements or features, let's say. Um, so I'm very conscious of time. I'll, I won't say any more than that. I'll let the others speak. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, uh, Sandra. Ricardo. Yes, maybe I can, can mention some of the efforts on the development of um, 
governance mechanisms for neurotechnologies and related technologies. So this is a very, a very new, new field uh, so far. There have been more efforts on, on artificial intelligence uh, or other emerging technologies. Uh, but in the last um, five or six years, there have been efforts for international organizations to start looking at issues of the development of these technologies, starting by the OECD recommendation for responsible innovation in neurotechnologies as the first uh, instrument of soft law that uh, addresses specifically neurotechnologies. Now, uh, through the discussions on artificial intelligence, there have been specific uh, um, areas where the impact of neurotechnologies have been addressed, as well as initiatives such as the Neuro Rights Initiative, which is trying to identify what is the impact that the neurotechnologies will have in human rights. With several uh, initiatives, uh, some of them are involved in, some others are not, uh, there's some part of the scientific community is engaged into identifying what seem to be the most important aspects that require um, specific governance mechanisms uh, with respect of these technologies and uh, trying to take this information to policymakers and to organizations such as this become a, an active dialogue that hasn't started properly yet and can in uh, due time uh, become an international framework for neural data governance. Uh, and this is one of the, the uh, specific activities that is ongoing at this moment and that we can mention that I, as uh, someone who has been involved in these processes. Thank you, Ricardo. Kevin? Well, just very briefly, in, in bio, we're probably a little bit further behind in the sense that even though we have the Biological Weapons Convention as sort of a focal point, it doesn't really have any teeth and there aren't that many outside efforts to get things done. Um, most of the effort is around DNA synthesis screening just because that is sort of something that we could actually plausibly do. And then in building defenses, because it's just not obvious how we can restrict information that could be misused without at least being perceived to harm science. And this is a hard one because if you ask most scientists if how they think about physics as a field, they say, it's fine, it's great, physics is wonderful. I mean, you know, we might like more breakthroughs recently, but it's perfectly healthy. Like, how about, you know, particle physics, high energy physics, nuclear physics, like, yeah, 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 physics is good. But nuclear physics is incredibly closely regulated for security purposes. And yet you suggest any kind of regulation in bio and people are like, oh my God, you'll, critic, you'll cripple all our ability to end aging. So it's really hard to get around that sort of knee jerk, any and all regulation and scrutiny is bad. And to be fair, most regulation that I'm subject to is filling out endless paperwork that doesn't actually address the problem at all. So we need some way to get around this problem. And that's why I'm hopeful about the algorithmic approaches that Sandra talked about. Good, thank you. Federico, what is the audience willing to talk about? All right, thank you, Jean-Marc. I am conscious of time, but I'm also conscious that our speakers have been answering the questions on the Q&A, but uh, you're not gonna get away with uh, not answering these live. Um, I've seen this question come up a few times and I think it's, it's, it's for Kevin. And uh, I think it's perhaps important to answer this so that our, the audience hears this, but um, is coronavirus a human produced pathogen and was it weaponized and released on, on, on purpose? Uh, Kevin, if you could weigh in on this just to, you know, clarify things a bit. Sure. So it was not a weapon. Bluntly, anyone competent enough to make it could have made a much more harmful weapon. Therefore, it was not a weapon. We don't know if it was an if it was a natural spillover from an animal, or if it infected some human who was out collecting viruses, or if it was collected in a laboratory and then accidentally infected a researcher. We just don't know. It could have been any of those. And we might actually never know. But I would argue it actually doesn't matter that much because we have a tremendous amount of data on accident, on laboratory accident rates. And so even if this is shown to have been the result of a laboratory accident, that's n equals one on top of a tremendously long list of data points. So it's not actually going to change our expectation of how often laboratory leaks are going to occur. All it's going to do is change the political salience of the problem. 
Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, another question we've had, and 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 Ricardo and Sandra have, have waited on this in the in the Q and A, and maybe so I'll, I'll ask them. But uh, this is maybe more general about the polymath, uh, uh, the goal of the polymath initiative. Uh, why uh, do or would people experts work more in silos than before? Uh, over spe specialization is not such a recent phenomenon. So, uh, Sandra or Ricardo, uh, who wants to go first? Yeah, I mean, so I guess then it's not, I don't think we're saying that there's necessarily any more siloization uh, to make up a new term. Uh, today, I guess what we're, we're seeing though is quite a few of these technologies spilling out, as you can see from what we described today, into issues that are very heavily influencing individuals and user at the society level, and then global initiatives at the, at the international security level, for example. So it's we're not really at liberty to sort of remain uh, only con considering our individual implementation. So for coming as from a technical perspective, it's, it's not sufficient today for me not to consider how whatever I produce might lead to or might potentially be misused, for example. So I don't think it's necessary that there's less uh, or, or more siloization, let's say today. I just think that we're at a point where we really, there's such changes in the environment and globally that we can't afford not to take account uh, of the the, the, the knock-on effects or the, the, the impact on alternative disciplines. Yes, uh, I completely agree with Sandra. Actually, we have seen that with emerging technologies, we have seen an increase on the reach these technologies have. We can have a global impact at very low cost, and uh, we are all seeing a decrease of the development cycles. So the technology is changing very rapidly. So the processes that we had for validating the technology, not only whether it is fit for purpose, but also if it's safe, um, we can no longer afford the time that we had before. And these technologies are being deployed very, very quickly and being updated very quickly and becomes very hard to be up to date on the risks that they can entail. So this makes that we have to take into account this, uh, this impact at the ethical level, societal and um, cultural level way early in the development process and change from a reactive stance to a proactive stance. And uh, <clears throat> so that makes a, an issue where uh, the, the need for breaking the silos is bigger today than it was probably a few decades before. And another aspect that uh, that I I mentioned in the in the written response is that uh, there is currently a lack of incentives for going across silos. Uh, the research and development is highly competitive, and sometimes the time and energy that you spend engaging with other sectors is not well rewarded if you want to follow a traditional academic career. I guess this is something very important uh, for us to, to discuss when we talk about policymaking. It's not only policymaking about how do we regulate these, um, these technologies, but also how do we develop the people who create these technologies and what are the skills that are necessary to uh, responsibly develop and innovate with this type of technologies that we have and these uh, extremely short cycles that the, these technologies have. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Um, again, I'm conscious of time, but we had two very interesting questions come in. Uh, so maybe I'll ask uh, our panelists to be brief, uh, brief in their answers. But uh, this is a question for Kevin. Um, we heard from Ricardo about the neurobioconvergence and maybe convergence technologies in general. Um, do you have any thoughts on risky emerging convergences uh, that you can see from a more conventional uh, Synbio and AI? Yeah, so in general, machine learning approaches to protein design are getting better and better. So folks may have heard of the amazing successes of the AlphaFold system, um, which is, came out of DeepMind's research labs. It's just revolutionary when it comes to predicting the structure of a protein from its sequence. If you have sort of the inverse problem where you want a protein of a particular, particular structure and therefore function, and you want to know what sequence will give you that function, that's the sort of thing that could easily be misused. Um, that's the sort of thing that would allow you to deliberately design a virus to, for example, evade the immune system. 
So one of the questions we're going to face is how are we going to make these tools available? Because they're not available yet, but the next generation machine learning guided protein design tools, I don't think we should open source them because then we're just letting people make whatever. Ideally, we would put them behind an API, let people submit requests with whatever data sets they want, and then screen the then screen the training data set they're providing or the specifications for the order for sequences that are hazardous. That way people can order designs for whatever they want, unless it's a functional equivalent of say something that could cause a pandemic. And then we would detect that query and we would not give them the design. Thank you, Kevin. Um, if we can squeeze in one last question here, uh, and it's something we haven't really talked about, but is, is, is big on, on, on the agenda of the UN at least, uh, could the panelists comment on the need for regulation of autonomous weapon systems? Uh, so I don't know if Ricardo or Sandra want to take this one. Yeah, this is a an, an ongoing discussion uh, uh, right now, and there have been you know, already several months of discussion around this aspect. And one of the, the issues here is the definition of uh, what is an autonomous weapon and what are the, the specific cases that uh, need to be regulated. Uh, some people are calling for, for a ban. And, and uh, there is always uh, a difficulty on getting people to agree what is an actual autonomous weapons or what are the systems that will need to be regulated in this way and will fall into an eventual ban. Um, there are, just for, for context, there are arguments uh, in favor and against. So one general argument is that it can uh, increase the, the, the accuracy of these weapons and can remove uh, the emotional aspects that can, that can affect how, how, how these weapons uh, yeah, act in, in, the, um, in the battlefield. However, this relies on multiple assumptions. I think this is an, an, an ongoing discussion where there is not a general consensus that it shows uh, not only the difficulty on creating a, a political agreement, but also the difficulty on creating a scientific and technological agreement about how can we characterize these systems. Sandra mentioned before that uh, it's very difficult to, to define what an AI system is. And uh, for people who have seen the latest uh, proposal of the European AI Act, this is one of the main criticisms that there is not a clear definition. And if we want to talk about autonomous weapons, the whatever uh, regulation that comes there will rely on a definition of AI. And this can become a catch-22 systems where establishing a regulation or even a ban can uh, I fail by, by a lack of a proper definition and creating uh, specific loopholes and actually a guideline about what you need to do in order to still have a system that can be considered by some an automatic um, an autonomous lethal weapon, uh, but not fall within that that domain. Thank you, Ricardo. We are conscious of time, and uh, I have one last question to to all of you in the spirit of the Halimaf initiative, uh, because we really want to bridge the gap between uh, people in science and technology and policymakers. So what would be the advice that you would give to policymakers to actually mitigate the potential risk of misuses of uh, the technology you are working in? Uh, Sandra, in a few words. <laughs> um, guidance to a policymaker. Um, I think th there are two things. One is, as this has come up several times in, in the conversation so far, the, the language, understanding the language of whatever it is that we're, we're discussing to making sure there's an appreciation of distinctions. There are a lot of um, uh, nuances uh, if you don't understand the language across uh, different uh, death disciplines, something that we still work on. So I'd say uh, a requirement to set in place um, the definitions and, and understanding of the terminology that's being used. Um, the other thing, which is really, really unpopular um, from a technology perspective, um, but that I would um, sort of, I suppose, request that policymakers push more is a slowdown on the technology. 
um, I, I, you know, from a technology perspective and the entrepreneurial activity, et cetera, innovation, it's, it's push, push, push fast as you can, as Ricardo's already alluded to that. So if policy makers can do one thing, maybe require that we slow down a little bit and put a few more checks and balances in place. Well, that, that probably will be uh, is a very controversial on the tech community because, you know, the Silicon Valley spirit is about move fast and, and break things. So you are actually arguing for, for the opposite. Uh, Ricardo? Yes. Um, uh, my, my advice goes, goes in a similar direction. I'm not sure if I would use the word slow down uh, because I, I we hear very often that technology is moving fast. And this is true at the point of discovery and the point of view of upgrading, but impact is not move, moving as fast as we sometimes think. Uh, it's true that we have technological developments such as the iPhone that was uh, non-existent uh, 10, 15 years ago, and now it's, everybody's using it. But in other areas, uh, if we think about, for instance, health, as you mentioned, mental health, there are many areas where we haven't done that, such, that, that progress. So I think we need to to redefine exactly what is the pace of the impact of technology and base policy, not only on the potential impact that they may have, and, and which is probably driving this rush to adoption that we see sometimes, but, also, but more evaluating the impact that it has and the validated impact. That'll be the, the first point. Try to really uh, couple with the pace. And the, the second one is that we need to keep monitoring these technologies after deployment. So we, it's no longer a process where we have a research phase, development and deployment, and these are those three separated phases. Now we are in a constant development and moving across these three stages in a permanent basis. So policy should be flexible enough to cope with this cycle there and the policies that, they, that we develop need to be consistent with it. Good. And Kevin? Well, I think the key is differential technology development. So one way of expressing that in a pithy way might be, let's not learn to make pandemics until we can reliably defend against them. How can policymakers do that? Well, work to first, once you see the problem that a pandemic capable virus is an accessible weapon of mass destruction, that's a meta principle, you can say it. You're not gonna make it any worse by saying it. And that's going to actually encourage more involvement and oversight by the security community of the science. So you might catch things earlier. Encouraging greater transparency in the science probably is gonna speed up the beneficial stuff because there's no point in keeping secrets from each other in terms of if what your goal is to accelerate things, you can also identify problems earlier. So incentivize sharing of research plans and peer review at an early stage could catch things before they go wrong. Specific things for policymakers, require DNA synthesis screening equivalent to the current industry standard or better. Work together to, um, work together to build these monitoring systems that can reliably detect any biological threat because that is deterrence, right? If you know that the international community will detect a new thing, you might not bother building it in the first place when it comes to weapons of mass destruction, um, if you know that there's an early response. And then the last one is, if we want to slow down the dangerous technologies, we know what some of those are. It's like the particular experiments required to improve our belief that a virus would cause a pandemic. Those are the equivalents of a nuclear test. So policymakers should say that and then implement regulations that make it more difficult for labs to acquire and perform those particular classes of experiments. This is less than 1% of virology, but that's the part that's harmful. And right now the attitude is circle the wagon, science is under attack. If they come for, your, if they come for one field, they'll come for my field next. We got to deal with that somehow. Well, thank you very much for uh, this uh, tour d'horizon of uh, the different opportunities, risks, and danger 
of uh, potential misuses of the technologies you are working in. And I think it was an excellent uh, introduction to what the Palimath Initiative is all about, really bridging uh, the two sides between the uh, policy and technology and, uh, and science. So uh, if you want to know more about our initiative, you can go on our website, gcsb.ch, where you'll find um, a dedicated page on the Palimath uh, Initiative. There will be more uh, events in the future, so stay tuned with uh, what we are um, doing, and you, we will also publish a few uh, publications. Again, thank you for um, uh, attending this this webinar. Also, thank again to the Prima Foundation for allowing uh, to create this um, the, this fellowship. And until uh, next time, uh, be safe and uh, uh, stay in touch through our website and social media channels. Thank you.